Welcome to the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. This podcast is about all things outdoor photography, including landscapes, wildlife, macro, and more. The show features two talented photographers, Henry Doyle and Ryan Taylor, who bring their different experiences in photography to the podcast. The show is released weekly every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so I hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. In today's episode, Henry and Ryan talk about backyard birding and their experiences with it. They go over bird species that they most commonly see as well as target birds, their favorite photos and stories from right outside their houses, and what gear helps them photographing birds in the backyard. Welcome back to episode 62 of the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. And today we're going out into our backyards. Yes, we are going to our backyards once again, but uh, today we're going to be talking about specifically birds and uh, kinds of wildlife you'd see back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is uh, kind of pertinent because last week, uh, both Ryan and I were busy, but last week there was a great backyard bird count. So a lot of people are talking about backyard birding, so we thought we'd throw our thoughts in on that. So. Yeah, for sure. And I know you, both you and I have done recently in like the past month, lots of stuff with backyard birds mm -hmm. and photographing them too. For sure. Yeah. And uh, before we go into that, um, we make sure to check out all of our social medias. Um, we've got Patreon, uh, Instagram, YouTube, you know, all those platforms. Um, so just make sure to check those out if you guys are interested. Yeah, definitely. And our Patreon. Yeah. Yep. Did you already mention Patreon? I did. Yeah. That's okay. Crap. <laughs> cut that it, out sorry i will it's good to mention it a second time you know <laughs> it's worth mentioning twice <laughs> uh wait oh. um just before i cut back in uh let's split up our updates in half so like we have something to talk about for updates on both all oh, right okay sounds good okay uh so you have any updates ryan before we start yeah um start i mean there's lots of exhibits coming up here soon which i'm really excited about um the most recent thing is i just got delivered last night um, as of this recording and it is a intentional camera movement shot of some like bright fiery orange uh tree foliage from i took the shot i think about three or four years ago but um, i got it ordered and printed on canvas uh, at 30 by 40 inches and it has like a black frame around it so it's completely new to me i'm printing something or ordering something at that size and just having uh, not only the canvas be there, but also the frame. And I'm in love with it, man. <laughs> I'm actually looking at it right now as I'm talking about it. And it's just the color on it's just spectacular. And um, I'm looking forward to um, hanging it up in this local uh, hospital facility that's opening up here um, come spring. So uh, really excited about that, uh, that I got the opportunity to you know, have a piece of artwork hanging up in some place uh, like that, an establishment or building like that um, is really, really cool. Um, it's probably the most exciting thing that's been happening lately for me, I guess. But, you know, how about you? Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's a great accomplishment right there. Uh, congrats. Hey. Yeah, um, for me, uh, I haven't had my computer in a while. I just got it back yesterday uh, when we are recording this. So I've been, you know, like importing a bunch of photos. So I've been doing a ton of shooting. You know, it's kind of nice not having the computer. I just going out all the time. Um I worked with some short-eared owls last week. I've kind of been on an owl kick. Um, there's this field. I, I can't give away the name, but there's this field in Louisville um, that apparently from December to February has these short-eared owls. Um, and, you know, they just they fly back and forth every evening. But I got there on the last two days of their them being there, and th their activity was really bad. They were far out in the field. Uh, but it was still amazing to see, um, but no good photos there. But... Um, it was an awesome experience, and it's kind of a good scouting thing for next year uh, when I'm back at back in town at Louisville around Christmas. So, uh, I did get some awesome. I did get some frame filling Harrier shots though while I was out there, so that was awesome. So, that's awesome. Yeah, those two go hand in hand. I'd say just because they, they yep. favor the open fields and the prairies and stuff. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, definitely, that's awesome though. I also got a lifer. Um, a savannah sparrow. I'd never seen one before. I'd heard them, but never seen them. So I, I got a good shot of that as well while I was out there. Uh, you know, because just w when you wait like that, you know, you have to get there around four um, and they could come out anywhere from like four to like 7 p.m. So w when you wait like that, you see all kinds of stuff. So uh, and I one day was cloudy and one day was uh, more sunny conditions. So I got to play with two different types of lighting. Um, it was pretty fun. So. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I, I would always recommend, even if you're like going at dusk for like 
like those kind of owls or whatever, it's like get there like an hour or two early and that way you can just kind of wander around mm -hmm. and you may get some like surprises like you got with the, the Savannah. I mean, like stuff like that can happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then the one more cool outing I've had recently, um, I was looking for a barred owl. I got a tip from a friend, uh, but I did not find the barred owl, but the sun was just setting and it was, you know, a completely clear day. Um, and I found some deer and I was able to backlight these deer or backlit these deer uh, with this golden light sun setting. And man, it's my favorite deer shots I've ever got. Like they're, I, I really love them. They're um, obviously they've dropped their antlers by now. So you don't get the antlers, but that doesn't even really matter. Like it's still super cool and you get that bouquet and then the, the golden orange light behind them. So that was awesome. It's awesome, man. Yeah, that's cool. Did you set out to find them or are you just, just kind of like a surprise? No, it was just in this little patch of woods where this barred owl usually is. Um, and they were right there. Um, very tolerant because they were park deer. So I could get some nice close up shots. And uh, yeah, I didn't plan for the sun angle or anything. Um, it just kind of worked out. So it's awesome, man. Yeah, right place, right time. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yep. It's awesome. Cool. Well, that's some nice updates there. Um, so let's go ahead and get in the episode, shall we? Yeah, for sure. Um, so do you want to kind of define backyard birding? I mean, it's, it's probably pretty obvious by the name, but like, what do you consider backyard birding? Well, I mean, if you have a backyard, you could probably bird it, I'd say. <laughs> sure. Simply put. Um, yeah, I mean, it just depends on really, um, it's kind of like that old saying, like build it and they will come. So, I mean, like if you put out some various, uh, bird feeders and different kinds of seed and stuff, like you can kind of just attract whatever you want in a sense. I'm not saying you're always going to get like you know, amazing warblers or something, you know, just depending on what your, your backyard and your setup is. But I mean, you can still attract some really beautiful and maybe some common songbirds, but also some really special species as well. Um, so it just, I think it really just comes down to like some initial investment into the, uh, I guess the displays of the feeders and everything and have them all situated, um, buying the seed, of course, and then just having it just laid out and allowing the wildlife to adjust to it after a couple of days or so. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, there are some people too, you know, they may not have a house. Um, uh, yeah, I think you could even backyard bird if you have an apartment, you know, there's always some kind of green space. Um, of course, get permission, but you, know, you can set up things, um, set up feeders. Uh, I know there is a question of ethics with feeders, but if you look into the research, um, because of kind of the urban environment we've built, um, in our present world, um, feeders are actually one of the only food sources, if not the only food source, uh, for a lot of songbirds and uh, sparrow species. So, uh, you know, it's great to have uh, those feeders up for them. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I can't say I'm really too surprised by it, but like, um, where do you stand on like, because you said ethics and all that. So we maybe could dive into that. But like a lot of people say like winter is the only time, especially to feed backyard birds. I mean, like, how do you feel about that? Or are you more like a all year, I guess, backyard feeder? So I have the feeders set up all year round because, um, you know, it's what I find is that you don't get a lot of birds in the other seasons anyway. So it's not really making much of an impact because, um, you know, in our yard, we've got like a, a juniper tree. Um, we've got a couple other like um, flowering or, you know, uh, I guess trees that produce fruits like, you know, the small little fruits uh, that birds eat. So, you know, they have, we have those sources in our yard um, and the feeder is just kind of a, a second option. Um, you know, I guess there are some places that it might be an ethical concern, but I'm, I'm not really against it personally. Yeah, I think it's because people always talk about like raptors or uh, specifically owls uh, being like unethical if you feed them like dead mice or, you know, some kind of bait or whatever. And um, if anyone's wondering, it's like, why is it not okay for owls to feed them, but like a uh, chickadee or something, but like, it's a little, it's, it's a weird, touchy, kind of weird subject to talk about. And I'm not quite frankly the best to explain it, but like the way I see it is like that those raptors and those hunters, they are, they learn through a like direct observation or just experience how to hunt and catch their prey and their food. Mm -hmm. And you're, if you're, I guess, like feeding them, you know, dead mice or something, it's like, you're altering the behavior so that they assume and expect it almost. So like they'll see a human come out in plain sight and I don't know, they might be struck by a car or might be killed by another owl of their kind or something. Like you never know really. 
and they're, they're less likely to survive because they lose that hunting instinct over time. Um, but like in the instance of like a backyard songbird or just any songbird that may visit a backyard, still wild, uh, wild bird, of course, mm-hmm. it's, it's a little bit different because it's, they're not really hunting for seed, I guess, in, in a sense, but I mean, they're still foraging and um, I can only see it as you're helping them survive, I guess, in a way, mm-hmm. like even if they can't find food sources or they're very scarce, like in like, let's say winter or whatever. Yeah, I think it's, I kind of see it as a way for compensating for what we've taken away from these birds too. Like, mm-hmm. you know, why not provide them a little stop off where they can, you know, refill. And, you know, a lot of these guys are on migration paths, you know, whether it be fall or spring. So, you know, they're not even going to be sticking around in the area long enough to, you know, build up a habit at your feeder or whatever. Um, so I, I don't really see much concerns with it. And, you know, it's really only those small birds, like you mentioned, like you don't see I mean, it'd be pretty cool, but you don't see owls swooping down on a bird feeder because, you know, obviously that's not what they eat. So, um, yeah. Plus it also, it provides almost like that cycle of life where like, um, there's been a few handful of occasions where I'm just outside my back you know, patio or just looking at birds or whatever in front of the backyard uh, window. And I'll see like a hawk swoop down and it flushes everything. Um, I've never quite seen it catch anything, but like it, if it did, I mean, that's just like reinforcing that cycle of life where, you know, you know, the bigger animal, I guess, is prey to, or falls prey to the other species or whatever, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, for sure. And, you know, you're not really interrupting that with feeders. So I think, um, you know, it's, you shouldn't be too concerned about it. Yeah. It only benefits, I think all, all the way around really. So. Yep. Uh, yeah. just make sure you get the right type of feed for, you know, what kind of birds you want. Like don't get you know, feed for some kind of exotic bird when you generally get, you know, like song sparrows or house sparrows in your yard, like just do your research, right. make sure it's not harmful to the birds uh, and try to get a squirrel proof one if you can too, because <laughs> those squirrels will steal all your feed in a couple of days if you, if you let them. So. Yeah. Even with like baffles and stuff on the big, like bird feeding pools is like, they'll still find a way because they can, they can jump pretty high up. I mean, they, they hop up. Oh on yeah. Those it's feeders. Crazy. And I mean, and they're the squirrels are so desperate. I mean, like they will be dangling off upside down, like just trying to get scraping for seed. It's I've seen some ridiculous like acrobatics and bouncing acts by those things. Mm-hmm. It's it's insane. Um, oh yeah. Some definitely. people some people like to feed them, and I've I've even tried some like dried like corn on the cob and putting that on like a little like screwed into a, like, a post or whatever, and like they'll eat it in the same day a whole t- whole entire ear of corn. <laughs> oh wow. I mean, it's insane. Even with like a big bag, I mean, they'll burn through it in like a week or two. And I'm like, and then still eat the bird's feet. So I just kind of like all but given up on feeding them because they already take so much away. Yeah. And don't leave very much for the birds. Yeah, I think, you know, squirrel feeding, you know, like it's good to kind of keep that separate. You know, if you're going to oh, feed yeah. the squirrels, like teach the squirrels that you don't go here. You know, you go here if you want food. Uh, but I d- it's definitely not essential to feed squirrels and, you know, I would just do it occasionally personally. Yeah, that's true. I don't, I don't believe squirrels really migrate as far as birds. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think they really quite need like the energy stores and the, the fat reserves and everything. I'm just imagining um, thousands of squirrels running down highways to <laughs> Florida or whatever. <laughs> In search of food. Yes. Yeah, they, they're they're pretty uh, resourceful. I mean, they'll they'll find something to eat. I think they're. Mm-hmm. I think, as far as I know, like especially like your common like tree squirrels. I'm pretty sure their populations are like of least concern. I don't think they're a big deal. Yep, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um. So, like going into kind of species that you see, um, in your yard. I don't know if Ohio's different, but like, what are some of the common species you'll see? Um. Let's let's start with winter, I guess. Um, since that's what we've been shooting a lot so yeah sure um so for most of the midwest i'd imagine um at least when it comes to like specifically winter time i'd say the dark eyed junco is probably the most common uh, bird species that we get um it's a part of the sparrow family and it's um, they're very very small about i think they're about the size of a chickadee and they're ground feeders um, so it means all the bird seed or scraps that may fall on the ground uh, below the bird feeders or wherever that's what they're going to be really like, uh, what they call scratching for when they like kick up whatever it is, the ground and stuff to get, um, whether it be like snow or leaves to get the bird seed that is. Um, so that's like the, probably the main species that's pretty specific to it. Um, I think I just had my first hairy woodpecker, which is pretty cool. And that's, that's more of a winter time. Um, as far as I know, I think it's more so 
common winter. Um, at least it seems when I see it. But I had my first one in the backyard um, like, like a couple weeks ago, which is really cool. And that, that's a woodpecker, of course. And I'm trying to think. Other ones, I mean, it's like some of those are year round and you just get them all year. But like, I think that's the main ones I get usually. Um, it feels like the like finches and stuff, um, namely like the house finches, it feels like they're more common in the winter, at least where I'm at. But mm -hmm. gold finches are kind of common all year. But of course, in the winter, their plumage gets much more duller, especially on the males. But I mean, of course, in spring, summer and early fall, you get the striking, you know, the gold yellow of the males that just it really pops off against the bird feeders. And you can see them easily and spot them. Mm -hmm. um, but there isn't too much though, too much differentiation, but like, I guess it depends once again on your backyard and how that's all set up. Like if you have like quite a few, you know, a dozen acres of land or some woodland, it's gonna be drastically different from like me where I'm like stuck in a suburban neighborhood and I just have like fences and houses around me. Mm -hmm. So it really, it really just depends on really what your, your setup and your location is, of course. Yeah, definitely. Um, how about you? For me, it's, it's pretty similar. Um, on the woodpecker note, though, I've never seen a single woodpecker anywhere near my house. Uh, I don't know what it is. I mean, we have plenty of trees. Um, and, you know, I, I see woodpeckers in nearby parks, but never seen one anywhere near me. Um, I do know they scare away, you know, smaller birds sometimes. So I guess that's kind of nice for the smaller ones. Uh, probably means I get a bit more of those. Um, every, every winter, I get a family of uh, white-throated sparrows. I get about four usually. I don't know if they're a family actually, but uh, those are really fun to work with. Uh, they're probably my favorite sparrow, or at least my favorite like common sparrow, uh, just because of that yellow head and that beautiful white throat. Um, and I'm pretty sure you know this, Ryan, but for the listeners that didn't know, uh, they like to forage on the ground rather than being up in the branches uh, like some of the other sparrows. Uh, so you can really get eye level and get some get great shots of them. Um, they're just really fun to watch and i don't know about you but they seem very cooperative to me yeah yeah they're actually yeah one of the more approachable and i, I can't believe i forgot that species because that's honestly one of my favorite birds of all time um they're very very handsome and cute their song literally just makes me smile every time i hear it no matter what and um yeah like I, you know echoing what you said it's like they're ground feeders so they'll be they'll be scratching on the ground trying to find seed and stuff and they're just so, I don't know, they're just so handsome and cute and, you know, very photogenic. And they're they're actually, like you said, a lot easier than a lot of other sparrows or any pastorines uh, to photograph because they are on that ground and you can get eye level and everything too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I also get cardinals. Uh, cardinals are so skittish, you know. Yeah. They're, they're <laughs> so common, but they're so skittish. It's crazy. No matter where you yeah. see them too, they're pretty much always the same level of scared for me. Um, yeah. That's, I agree. It's yeah. like just it, it could be your backyard. It could be out deep in the woodland, like the most we'll call it wildest, wildest of places or remote. And like, yeah, they just I don't know. They just never they elude my camera almost all the time, given how common they are. I got one good cardinal shot this season and that was it. Uh, <laughs> and that was only because I, I was actually laying on the ground and it landed above me on like a, a bird feeder or like the top of a bird feeder. So I was able to look straight up and kind of cut out the bird feeder. Um, and right. just looking right at him. Uh, but that was literally the only Cardinal shot I got like from backyard birding. And there's literally a Cardinal there every day. So uh, <laughs> it's, That's a, it's interesting for sure. It's yeah. It's I, it, it, honestly, it, it expands to even beyond Cardinals. Maybe at least I see it. It's like, you know, like blue jays or crows or something like that. It's like those those two are pretty tough to photograph in my experience. I don't know why. Like some of the more special, like non-backyard species that, you know, birds, it's like they're almost easier to photograph than a common blue jay. Like it's just kind of weird like that to me. Yeah, and the, the name common too can be deceiving. I mean, you'll see them everywhere. Oh, yeah. But they're not common to like, you know, view or approach or photograph, so. Yeah, we, we need the endless like, this idea of like, or naming that is of like birds with common. Uh -huh. I just feel like, I just feel like it's belittling other ones too. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Side note, but uh -huh. and yeah, it's, I'm going to take a contrarian approach on the goldfinch thing. I actually way prefer a goldfinch in the winter. Like hmm. I think the, you know, there's the warbler color yellow, but then there's the goldfinch color yellow in the summer. I think it's just a, too far for me. 
it just looks very i don't i don't like the color personally I like it's a the, little good sorry go ahead i was just gonna say it is a little i don't want to say tacky but like it, it it's striking it's uh -huh. striking when you get like a like a summer green canopy and like there's just this bright tiny yellow bird and but i feel like that's the i'm gonna take the contrarian point of view but like or devil's advocate but like it's also beautiful because like my mom doesn't go out to bird watch like i do like she doesn't look for warblers or anything crazy and probably can't identify them but like she loves seeing those goldfinches in the summer in her backyard mm -hmm. and like seeing that bright yellow is like just really cool kind of like the same way people say about like a cardinal where it's or a male one that is where it's like very bright red and it, just the color itself is beautiful no matter the the rarity of the species or not mm -hmm. but yeah yeah that's that's definitely a good point for sure you kind of got to look at it from the um more average birder perspective as well uh, mm -hmm. but i had some great you know experiences with goldfinches um uh, especially in the winter you know just uh they stay up pretty high i've never seen them on the ground at least in my yard um uh, but i got a couple shots looking straight up once again and i really like them so awesome yeah it's weird how you don't get many woodpeckers though i mean like i ever since i started backyard birding or you know, birding in general, it's like, I see more and more woodpeckers in my backyard, um, which is hard to believe because like there's some older trees and some taller ones around here, but like in the grand scheme of things from their like point of view, it's pretty sparse. Like it's not some deep woodland that I'm in. It's like mm -hmm. just a whole bunch of, it's like, it's almost like a sparse woodland where there's just many different trees, but they're scattered and there's like lots of open yard in between. But like I see red belly woodpeckers and downies like every day, honestly, it's, it's mm. honestly pretty great. And like, they'll be on just my single silver maple tree in my backyard. But like, yeah, everyday occurrence, nut hatches as well. I know they're not woodpeckers, but kind of like the same idea with trees. And huh. yeah, it's pretty cool. And, um, you know, adding on to what you said about um, them kind of like uh, flushing away other birds, it's kind of amusing in a way. Cause like every time a red belly like clings onto one of my feeders, that's, you know, they're all kind of situated and clumped together. All the other birds seem to like fly away to like the nearby trees, like almost cause they're almost woodpecker in particular is almost bigger i guess but huh. um it's kind of strange but um i had one time i think it was last year in fall i had a flicker actually that i clearly identified it was out conspicuously perched on a suet cage and it was like eye level and it was wild man just wow. to have that in my backyard because i've never heard of i don't think i've ever heard of flicker like in my neighborhood until then so i just thought that was a cool find honestly too yeah that's that's interesting because um, you mentioned the nut hatch too. I've never seen any nut hatch, no brown creeper, nothing in my yard. Uh, yeah. I think it might be because we've got we're surrounded by some really tall trees, like uh, probably fifty feet tall. I wonder if they're all the way up there. Uh, I don't know. I, I'll have to check with my binoculars sometime. It could be that. Um, I've never had a bright, uh, excuse me, a brown creeper in my backyard. Um, I had a pileated woodpecker, I think, twice. Whoa. Which that was in. That, I know that was that was a uh, that was something special right there to yeah. say the least something I would not expect but I guess it was just passing through because I've only seen it like two or three times in the past couple of years so it's not like an everyday occurrence um it's not quite winter I know we're on the topic of like winter specifically but like in the summer there's a nearby my house doesn't have a chimney but uh, I think like a house diagonally across the street from me has a chimney and there's always chimney swifts that fly around like all day basically during the summer and it's awesome like cool. it's not really it's not really good for like a photo op perspective but like it's just so cool when i go outside especially at like dusk you know right for dark and it's just like you hear that little like like chirpy kind of buzzy sound that they make and there's like four or five of them just like buzzing around my house it's really cool man these little flying cigars you know yeah as they call <laughs> that's awesome but that's a that, that's a cool bird um i think they belong to the is it the swallows or are they just, is Swift a family on its own? I can't remember. I think they're a type of swallow. I'm pretty sure. Because they definitely have that kind of flying mm -hmm. thing to them. But yeah, besides the point, um, this is one cool bird that's, it's more seasonal. Cause like I said, they're, they're more common in the uh, summertime. Yeah. Have you ever gotten a uh, warbler in your backyard in spring or fall? Um, no, if it, if I did, okay. I, I can't say for certain I've seen warblers in my backyard just because once again, the habitat's not quite right. But if there was to be a warbler, 
I don't know, it might be yellow rumps just because of the commonality of it, especially like year round and everything. Once again, I'm not saying I've seen it, but I'm just saying like the likelihood. Um, I do have these three pine trees, pine gun trees that are like lined up as like almost like a fence row that like divides the property line between uh, my backyard and the one uh, on the other side of it. And I'm always hoping every year for pine warbler and <laughs> st the likelihood once again is very slim just because it's only just three pine countries. But I mean, they're like, they've grown up massively since I've lived here, um, or, you know, born and raised here, I guess. But like, it's just I, something I feel like it could be a possibility, but I still haven't quite seen. Um, so but every time I see like a goldfinch or a something or other, I'm always hoping, you know, if I zoom in on something, I'm hoping it's a pine warbler. Still haven't gotten it. <laughs> and man, that would be awesome. You know, you could just walk out your door, uh, work with all the different lighting and just get that perfect shot over an entire season. That could be super right. cool. Right, right. Yeah, that's cool. Um, um, I do know somebody, uh, I forget his name, um, but um, he has a nesting uh, yellow warbler uh, who lives in a, a pink dogwood tree in his backyard. I am so jealous. Ooh, He's got the pink good. dogwood tree with the contrast of the yellow. It's super cool. That's awesome, man. Shoot. I think one of the best parts uh, about backyards is in spring. Um, I have a crab apple tree that's in between some bird feeders in the middle of it. And there's a bird bath underneath. And like those blossoms turn this bright, bright pink in April. It's like mid April for about two weeks or so. And then they doll out to like this uh, kind of maroon red color and just fade away and, you know, wither away. But like, man, those two weeks, man, I'm always out there in the backyard trying to get some like songbirds on that perched on that tree. And it, it's tough because when they flower, I mean, they're so dense. So like you have to hope that they get in a good view of it. But like when you get them in the right spot, um, I'm thinking calling back to, I think two years ago when I got some tough to tip mice on the tree, I got some close-ups with the pink blossoms, man. And it just, it's stunning to say the least. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's another thing about knowing like tree color or tree uh, foliage and just like the seasons in general can really help make, I think more compelling photographs and more colorful compositions and everything. So Mm -hmm. um, stuff stuff like that can really aid it and if you have the means to do it i mean you could plant native pollinating plants you could um plant trees if you can i mean like you can make i think the cool part about the backyard is like once again i know your means may be limited if like you're an apartment but like if you have lots of land you can kind of just like your own canvas you can kind of just do whatever you want set it up how you want and make it right for if you want to just bird watch or if you want to set it up to be more suited for photography and have like tree snags and stuff to be like natural perches on like it's almost limitless what you can do and it's pretty cool well see you do mention lots of land though um but that's that's the only thing like the more land you have the harder it is to get these interesting birds in your backyard um you know they're going to be there but they're going to be massively spread out um right you know what I, what I like about you know kind of a smaller backyard is you know you know the spots like you can just perfectly know every inch of your yard um like i know the white crowns i know they'll they'll go under my feeder for a while in our front yard uh under the juniper tree they'll uh you know they'll get the seed on the ground um and then they'll fly over we have the screen porch and they go to the side of the screen porch um and under these magnolia bushes um and then they'll go back it's like a cycle so but since it's like such a small yard i'm able to study this and like specifically know the behavior so i feel like there's definitely an advantage to having just you know your average size yard versus a big plot of land yeah that, that's a great point yeah um it's cool they get white crowns though I, I don't get those at all um how long did it take you to really like witness i guess or realize that pattern of behavior um so i think the second week of january we got our first snow, our first snowstorm um and i first day you know i didn't really notice it but then i started to um want to like plan you know a shot i wanted to get super close to the white crowns um so i just watched them for a while didn't take any photos uh and then i moved in um and got the shots um you know i did some snow stuff um probably my favorite shot with with them um i went under a magnolia bush um in pouring down rain i had a rain cover on and stuff and I got these white crowns like covered in raindrops um, under the magnolia bushes. Um, but that was only because I knew their path. I knew where I could hide. So I was out of their path, um, but I could get the right angles. So, 
That's awesome, man. Yeah. Taking advantage of the weather conditions and, you know, just like I said, the pattern of behavior and stuff and using that to your advantage. That's awesome. For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you know of any patterns in your backyard? Um, I mean, besides like, you know, could be common to most birders, you know, at least I hope is like chickadees. I guess like we could talk, you know, touch upon at least that the way certain birds feed or whatever you want to call it, like it's different from one another. So like, like a Carolina chickadee, they take a, they basically fly to the feeder when there's like an opportune moment. Like they don't like to be crowded around quite like finches do um, and just have like tons of them on the feeders. But like, if there's like a nice quiet moment or pause between all the other birds coming in. They'll fly in. And I mean, like they'll just kind of nab a seed, like a, I don't know, a black oil sunflower seed. They'll fly to like the nearest perch or tree and then put that like little seed between their um, their claws and just will start pecking it open. Oh, you ever wow. seen that? No, I have not. Yeah. That's amazing. There's probably some like really good like slow-mo video of it, I'm assuming out there on the internet, but like look it up. It's it's really neat to see that behavior up close. Um and I've kind of see it from a crab apple tree. It's like, yeah, they'll just swoop right into the feeder, take a seed, and they'll be right back up on a tree nearby, like within a few seconds. Um and it's it's interesting that how that behavior goes for that species because like I said, like other ones like to kind of just meander and stick around the feeders and that kind of over overcrowds them. Um, but like, that's one such species that just kind of gets in and gets out in a way. Um, same with the tit mice too. I don't really see them stick around too much. Um, certain species just, I don't know. It's just, it's whatever their behavior may be lent itself to doing it that way, um, which is pretty fascinating too. You know, that's another thing, you know, with the tit mice, they, I don't know their behavior because they don't go in my backyard either. Like it's, it's crazy how we've had such different backyards and, you know, such different behaviors too. Like we, we get chickadees back here, um, but I've never seen, you know, what you're talking about. So. Huh. Yeah. That's weird, man. Especially since we're not that far away in the grand scheme of, you know, the flyways and stuff too. It's weird. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> we've been like the best finds in your backyard. Like, like your mm. personal, like, like least common to see, but you did kind of birds. Uh, Shoot, let me. Uh, I got I got quite a few. If you want me to go ahead. Oh wait, I just I just remembered one. Um, so I had golden crown kinglets. I think they're still there, actually. That's awesome. Um, they're up in a. We have a holly tree, but it's pretty tall, and they stay up towards the top. Uh, but they're there. Um, and you know you hear their distinctive call. Um, you see the little guys. You know, I mean they're small birds, so they're hard to spot in the first place. Um, it's really cool to know they're back there. So it's awesome, dude. Kinglets, man. I know early on, I like not really just backyard, but like just in general, I mistaked American goldfinches and like the fall for kinglets. Oh, wow. Golden crown, golden crown. Like I had a shot from like five years ago now, and like I sat on that shot. Like I had on my like website back in the day because I was proud of it, I guess. But it's like these three <laughs> local park. There's like these three. Uh, kinglets in quotes um like perch on the same tree branch and like just kind of all facing different directions and i thought it was the coolest shot but then i was like it took me a couple of years to realize oh this is not even kinglets these are goldfinches <laughs> i got my hopes up but like nowadays it's like you know not the flex but it's like it's easier to find kinglets because i'm more accustomed to seeing them and knowing habitat and behavior but like back then man i was just like misidentifying it like crazy <laughs> There's just a slight size difference there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I was more focused on the color and plumage to like uh -huh. be concerned about size because I'm like I can't just like crap the bird and see it up close to know the size. So I was like, eh, this looks close enough. Got my hopes up, but <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, just a little amusing side note. Yeah. What about you? Oh man, um, I had a couple of great finds. Um, Hilly woodpecker is one of my favorite birds. So like I said, like over the past few years, uh, seeing that on and off, it's very rare for me, but like the few times I have seen it, man, it's just crazy to see up close, um, at least in that you know scale, I guess. But um, more recently I had a red breasted nuthatch. hatch. Um, it was a real quick, uh, we had this big ice winter storm or something um, at the beginning of February. Um, I think it was like 12, 13 inches total of snow. Um, lots of like big sheets of ice. Everything was just like, you know, had icicles draping off of it. And it was just, it was pretty wild because I was seeing like crazy amounts of birds for like an entire weekend at my feeders. Um, so much so that I actually went out on one of the days and like 
just went out and photographed them basically. Um, and most of that was at like eye level. So like lots of the sparrows and juncos, like we mentioned, you know, the ground feeding birds, um, some of the doves, some of the cardinals, but then I also got this really quick moment. I'm talking like probably like five, 10 seconds at most. This nuthatch just swooped right in. And to anyone that seemed like a red breasted compared to the white breasted nuthatch, the, the white breasted are much more, I don't want to say sluggish, but I feel like they're slower in their just movements. But like, mm -hmm. there's something about the red breasted that are just, they're, they're much have a, I don't know, they have like a much more sleeker flight pattern and they're faster. I, I don't even think they're even bigger or smaller. I can't quite, you know, recall that detail if they are. But anyways, I saw this red breasted one come in from the same pine cone trees I mentioned swooped into the feeders um it went on like one of the capsule feeders and just like took a few seed or whatever tried to and i'm talking like a few seconds and then swooped and flew back into the pine cones and i was like but it was just enough that i'm looking through my telephoto and i was like that's it i was like holy crap because i don't see that bird often and i was really surprised to see it in my backyard but there it was so it's pretty that's cool awesome. for a winter bird yeah, yeah I've, I've never heard of anybody having that in their backyard so it's super cool <laughs> Yeah, um, it was really cool to see that. Um, the other one that I'm thinking of, and uh, I know we both talked about it before we started recording, but that's the rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, so the past couple Mays or Springs, um, I had this male that would just like show up for, honestly, it was always about a week. Like I'd see it for about five or maybe six days straight at my feeders. And I'm talking like I'd be casually walking by my back window or something, not really focused on photography, uh, but like just, you know, glaring out outside my window and just seeing it. And it would always be feeding stuff. And it's, if you've ever seen a rose breasted, you know, it's indistinguishable. Like it's, in my opinion, hard to mistake it for any other kind of bird, especially those males with that plumage. That's very, just beautiful to say the least. I mean, it, there's such a cool bird. Um, so yeah, seeing that one male or so, or so was just always a treat. And so I'm hoping the same will be, this will be the same case for uh, come spring this year too. Yeah, that's, that's a great find. Like, wow. I mean, that's a beautiful bird. Yeah. Um. <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know that what that is, um, it's kind of like a, a red Oriole. Like if you replace the orange on an Oriole with red, it kind of looks like that. I think they're kind of in the same family. So uh, I think they're, they're in the, the Cardinal family or it's gross beaks, but like the same family as like a Northern Cardinal. Oh, yeah. okay. My bad. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's very apt description. I mean, it does have the same about size or so and the plumage at least the patterns on it, the field markings are very similar mm -hmm. to like an Oriole. So I, I agree with you, but um, not to be politically correct, but it is like the gross beaks are more close in line with like Cardinals. Yeah. Um, but, but regardless, you know, it's a beautiful bird. Um, anytime I have seen it, regardless, it's, it's just, they're, they're stunning. Even the females too. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking um, online. There doesn't seem to be a lot of good photos of them. So. <laughs> uh, you know, it seems like it's a pretty kind of rare bird and just the fact that it's in your backyard, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I think it's just more so for the standards of like a backyard, especially in like small town, Ohio kind of thing. Like it's, that's to me, that's a great find. And, um, you know, something, like I said, I'm excited and eager to see every time it happens. Um, do you get lots of like hummingbirds in the spring, summer and parts of fall? Yes. Well, not lots, but we get one. Um, there's these red flowers in our front yard um, that it likes to rotate to. Uh, our neighbor has hummingbird feeders. We don't. So the, the hummingbird will cycle between uh, her feeders and then our uh, red plants. Um, I've never gotten a good photo because my old camera um, could not autofocus on a hummingbird. No matter how hard I tried, it was impossible. Like quite literally yeah. impossible. Uh, <laughs> but I'm definitely going to try for that this year. Um, you know, just kind of set up because hummingbirds don't really care about people like they'll literally come right up to you um i would even suggest wearing a red shirt because that actually attracts them <laughs> um you know they'll come right up to you you can get great shots honestly mm -hmm. i've even seen it like the local you know wherever your bird feeders are sold i guess or hardware store um you ever seen those like little like rings that you wear but it has a little bit of like the sugar water you can fill it with and it's like a little it's like a ring that you wear on your finger but it's a feeder a single port oh and like wow. i've never I, I need to get one someday so honestly this is a good reminder um before spring you know happens or summer that is but like i kind of want to try it and see if they actually go for it yeah that's that's a great idea wow i'm gonna get one of those because <laughs> they are a very they're very uh, approachable and sociable kind of bird um they're fiercely territorial though which is kind of amusing considering how small they are but like 
they're very dominant on territory with other hummingbirds. Mm. Um, but they will, yeah, I mean, I've had them like right in front of me on a feeder. Like I'll be outside reading a book or newspaper and like they'll be just right there on the feeder that's like five feet away from me and they do not care. You know? Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's such high energy, I think, and like, especially in terms of migration, it's like, I feel like it's so important to feed them um, that sugar water because of just the, the the amount of calories they burn coupled with the millions of miles they must travel just to get down to South America too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe I should consider a feeder for them. Yeah. Or even put up more than one. Like I said, in case you do get so many, it's like that way they're not just like fighting over it. Um, mm-hmm. I think I've only seen at most two of them kind of like engage in something of like a squabble, but like it's quickly disputed, you know, like one will just fly to a nearby tree and sit there for a while until the other's done but um i mean they're great man it's like now that i've set out those feeders like before i got into birding and like all this kind of stuff like i never saw a hummingbird before let alone my backyard but like i will literally set out one maybe two feeders uh hummingbird feeders at most and like you see them around the clock especially during the summer like it's insane just to think about like like i said at the beginning of the episode build it and they will come and like it's pretty much true for all all mm-hmm. things really yeah yeah, I mean, I, you know, I will say, like, that's not always true, at least in my backyard. Like, um, you know, I've tried to attract specific species. Like, um, yeah, I've tried to get, last year I even tried to get warblers, like, a little bit. Like, trying to get, you know, like, some mango and that kind of stuff. You know, I got nothing. You know, it's, it's not a guarantee, but I definitely see what you mean. Like, um, you know, kind of putting up those... Uh, make it as easy as possible to get those unique species. But. Yeah. And that, that's a good realistic point of view. Like maybe I'm being a little too like rosy and uplifting about it or positive, but like there definitely is a lot of like challenges involved with all of this. Like um, one of my examples to add on to that is Orioles. Like some people in like my, my County even, or my area, like they'll put up some orange, uh, orange slices or jelly and like mine get overrun by ants and wasp and, bees and all that stuff but i've never seen a single oriole in my backyard it's really weird huh. i don't know what i'm doing wrong but like i will not see a baltimore oriole or anything so well they, must, they the... must just not pass through your area and they don't even know that it's there. Well, it's like yeah it's it's weird because then i'll see it like photos online of like some of my local groups i'm in and like the next city over like people have like three of them on there and he got a photo of it so like i don't know what's the matter if it's just i'm just not lucky with it or if i'm not doing it right it's, it's very strange, but sometimes you just can't explain it. Some things just either have to be persistent and like keep supplying the feed or whatever it may be. And like they might come or sometimes you may, you know, try it so much and just nothing really comes of it. So it's, it's definitely a toss up. And um, I've learned trial and error over the past couple of years of like what's what's worked for me and what hasn't really with backyard birds. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Is there any like target birds that you're hoping for or anything like, is it just like warblers? I mean, like what, what like warblers in particular are you really you wish you would get? In the backyard specifically? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just hope for a yellow rumped. Like I've only seen one once in my backyard. Um, I just want them to come back like, you know, so I can work with them for a while and get a really good shot. Um, as far as like habitat goes, I've got some like coniferous trees uh, I don't have a hemlock, but I've got like um, cedar, which is kind of close to hemlock. So yeah. may- maybe a Blackburnian. <laughs> <laughs> we can hope. Uh-huh. Um, Build it, they will come. <laughs> yeah, if I get a Blackburnian, you got to drive down here t- too. That's, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> and uh, so that's awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's other, what are the other hemlock warblers? There's a couple other ones, right? Uh, Black footed green. Or, or sorry, blue throat. Wait, what's it called? Uh, yellow throat. Or yeah, there's common yellow throat. They they definitely I think prefer those coniferous like uh-huh. yeah like cedar hemlock. Um, what are the other ones, man? Uh, I'm not the best. I'm not the I'm not the best of my ID. Uh, yeah, black throated green would probably be another contender. I, I don't know that we'd ever get that in the backyard, but that'd be amazing. <laughs> I get it in my area, but I I can't see the backyard being a commonality for it. Um. <laughs> Yeah, what else is there, man? I don't even know. I mean, I'd love to get an Oriole in my backyard. I mean, oh, I, yeah. that's not hemlock, but uh, that'd be awesome. Right. Um, right. Northern Parula. Parula. Oof. Oh, yeah, they're Parula. hemlock. That's right. I'll never, 
I guarantee you'll never get that in my backyard. But is it, is it pronounced Parula or Perula? Perula. Oops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Don't edit that out. Um, yeah, that'd be cool birds, though. I um, I, I've always been well, thinking. I'm speaking before I think. I'm trying to think of birds that would be cool to see. I mean, yeah, the Orioles would be nice. Um, I don't know what else I'd really like want. Because I'm trying to be realistic about it. I mean, I can always hope for like some kind of, I don't know. We get some hawks every now and then, and it's usually like a red shouldered hawk, uh, a couple of Cooper's hawks, you know, just like stuff you'd see in a backyard, right? For raptors, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one time I had a good photo op, really impromptu one at that, with a red tailed hawk, which is really neat. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah. So, and, and like those opportunities are very seldom. Like it's not just like an every day for me, at least the times I do see them. Um, I think what else has really been cool? Um, there's been a few crows on the ground, I guess. Um, <laughs> one time, actually, sorry, I keep like rattling off stories. I'm just remembering stuff as I go. But I remember it was a really, really rainy day. This is a couple of years ago. And my mom sent me a picture back, it was way back when, but like she sent me a picture of this like little like uh, ground in part of the water. It was basically like a puddle formed in the grass. And there's these two mallard ducks just like sitting in it. It's the weirdest huh. thing I ever. And like my yard is not water habitat but like it was the weirdest thing to just see these two ducks just in my backyard i don't know it was something different see so. i i have a kind of a storm overflow creek in my backyard so i wonder if wait actually now that i think about it we do get ducks i have gotten ducks back there before that's cool so, you know maybe i'll work yeah. with them <laughs> yeah other than that i mean like i've seen you know turkey vultures flying over my house um great blue heron flying over my house um i would always I've always dreamed of having like this reconstructed marsh or like a wetland as my backyard. Um, it's not realistic, but it's just like a dream of mine to have that as a backyard. That'd be Letting so the fun. grass grow wild and just, you know. Dude, you tell me, like, could you imagine the stuff you'd get? Ugh. Oh, I'd, I'd love to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I love, I love to say like, I get Virginia rail or Sora or like, just, like just birds like that in my backyard. Oh, Virginia just... rail. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Well, I'm just saying, like, if I really lived out in the boonies kind of thing, like, True. a real wild, yeah. like, er, like I said, like, if I could reconstruct it, if it's not already there, like, like just the idea of that, just, it's it's a fantasy of mine, I'm just like, uh, someday, but not today. I mean, but you could, have, you could have a Virginia rail in your backyard, and you may never see it, that's how elusive they are. Yeah, I know, but it's just the, it's the idea of it, just the building that uh-huh. habitat, and, like, the, the variety of species you may see, I just think that idea of that's just so cool to me. Oh, like, yeah, for sure. You know, maybe I'm just kind of tired of the Midwest backyard trope. I don't know. Maybe it's just that. But I mean, I appreciate I appreciate what I have, you know, of course. But it's just like we can always dream. Yeah, I think backyard birding is really the most powerful in winter. Like, oh yeah. When I think of spring, I do not think of my backyard. I think of uh, going out into the woods and looking for warblers and looking for all that stuff. Uh, looking for shorebirds. Like I've got a couple shorebird spots and uh you know i've got a mallard duck spot for ducklings uh you know all kinds of stuff and it's just not you know like the backyard will be something like oh i only have an hour today to do photography let's just do the backyard Um, yeah I, i mean it's unfortunate that it becomes that but like you know unless i find some crazy bird back there um i'm not gonna invest a lot of time in it but i think winter's a different story but spring you know it's just you gotta kind of prioritize your time i think yeah i I definitely see where you're coming from and i agree with a lot of that um it's definitely a thing that gets i think it gets underappreciated a lot of the times especially for like us younger folk that are just more like like we go out and stuff and we go out to these parks and trails and like we can see all these different variety of birds and habitats that they're in it's kind of like the backyard kind of gets tossed aside a little bit but I do agree with you. It's like when it's winter, um, especially like I personally hate the cold. Um, I, I can live with it, but like I still just don't like it. So like sometimes it is easier just to view birds and from my window and just you know appreciate them that way. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I got to ask now, what do you think that is? Like, why do you think it's just, is there just like a desire to get out and travel and like go elsewhere? Is it just something like that? Well, or? so I think this can kind of like segment into another you know topic here, but or another part of this topic, um, you know, the backgrounds and the lighting of your backyard, or at least for me, are pretty bad. Um, I, so kind of the way the sun for me, it rises um, behind the house, wait, no, it rises in front of the house, 
So I can't get that early morning golden light because by the time it's gotten over the house, we have a two story house. So by the time it's gotten over, it's harsh, basically. Uh, and then in the evening, uh, it doesn't work either uh, because of a fence and other houses. So basically, I'm limited to cloudy days, um, which more and more I'm finding myself not being a fan of cloudy conditions. Like I, I really am just trying to be a, a better user of light. Um, so it's it's definitely challenging for me um, in the backgrounds too, because we've got fences, houses, um, pretty much at most angles. You know, there's only specific windows where I can get you know a good background. So. Right. Yeah. That, that's totally a valid point. Um, worth raising is like definitely just your, you know, quite simply your circumstances, I guess. And like that, that really sucks though. Just you're pretty much, like you said, limited to like overcast days or like just suffering with the high noon light, like whether you like it or not. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not too bad. Like, uh, you know, in the, you know, when you get those birds on the ground, you know, I'll get down eye level and then, you know, everything completely fades away. You know what the eye level effect does. Like it, it just compresses everything. Um, so that's a remedy to that. But obviously that doesn't work with all the species. Uh, and, you know, with the overcast light too, getting eye level uh, kind of replaces the need for dramatic light, I think. So. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. It's just, yeah. Something you, at least you've kind of like learned to live with it or you just like you said just kind of go elsewhere and just see other locations and what that has to offer because it might be better light or better use of that light really um but you know it's a valid point though yeah um it's you know i, I don't want to complain because you know i've gotten some great shots back there uh, you just have to be creative with it and you're not going to get good shots the first day in your backyard uh, no matter how easy it looks like you don't really know your backyard, you, you know, may, you may think you know it, but once you really start getting into it, you really learn all the secrets to it. So. Yeah. Plus you might be surprised. Like I've, um, I don't think if I don't think I've ever got lifers in my backyard necessarily, but like there have been a few. Was that like, grill speak? Not a lifer. No, I had seen it at least a couple times prior, um, at, at various locations, but like still like for, maybe like we'll call it a backyard lifer like that's a big deal to me and like that's one that's just really, really cool to see um so yeah there's been a few surprises like that so i mean it's like it's definitely one of those things where like i agree I'm, I'm much more about being on the move like i'm not really like a wildlife blind photographer like i like to be mobile shooting handheld for birds like and just kind of moving around most of the time but like yeah this the idea of being staked out in my backyard for hours on end like well it can produce some great shots and it can really be kind of almost relaxing in a way. It's like, I'm just not, it's not my style, I guess, of photography too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah, I like to mm -hmm. be mobile for sure. Yeah. I mean, of the times you've done backyard uh, bird photography, is there any like specialized gear you use? Like, do you use a blind? Uh, do you use like a ground pod? Is there anything like you would call specialized that you use? So I didn't get an actual blind up until last week, actually. Uh, I just bought one. <laughs> um, but I do have a, a camo net that I'll throw over myself. Um, and uh, that works pretty well. Uh, I, you know, they, these birds are much more tolerable. I sure they, I'm sure they know I'm there, uh, but it kind of helps break up the major form. Um, kind of hide some of those movements. Um, what about you um, when it comes to that? Um, I do have one of those, like, I think they're called Tragopan or Tragopan. I think it's a brand. Like, those those pop-up wildlife hunting. They're more, like, so for hunting, I guess, blinds. And they're just made of, like, a mesh neoprene kind of material with some, like, stakes that go, you know, bisected, I guess, in the middle of the frame. And, like, th that works pretty well. Um, you know, you know, I guess, say, for windy days, you have to, like, stake it down into the ground. But, like... I've used that a handful of times throughout all of seasons and like it produces some great results, but like, once again, I don't have like thick brush or anything to really offset it against. So you're literally seeing from the outside of it, just a, like a pop-up blind right in front of like the bird feeders. Like it kind of looks dorky and awkward. Um, but you know, maybe the birds get situated to the camouflage um, after a while, which um, is, is another important point to raise is like being patient. Um, so like, if you get out before sunrise and get situated, like they're less likely to see you, I guess. But like, 
even if you're out midday, you're probably going to flush them as you, you approach the feeders. But like if you sit around for a while or, you know, just wait, they'll probably just start coming back, but it might be a few minutes or, you know, a little while to really, for them to adjust your, I guess, uh, introduction to the area. Um, but like other than that, um, I've used a ground pod um, during the winter or when there's snow on the ground. Um, I've done stuff like using a blanket or I've even put on chest waders that are like insulated. So that way I could just lay flat out in the ground and do that. Um, photograph that way. Um, other than that, I don't know. I mean, other than that, it's just kind of like the same setup, really. Mm -hmm. Camera, telephoto lens, binoculars, maybe a spotting scope. Tripod, probably, um, just because of how I'm going to be not mobile as quite as often. So, like, I can just kind of use that stability to my advantage, of course. Um, but that, that's pretty much it, though. I mean, nothing too crazy. Yeah. I mean, I'll do the, I'll do the same thing, pretty much. Like, I'll, I'll lay down a tarp instead of waders. Um just because, you know, I don't need to put on waders since it's just my backyard. So I'll, I'll just put that right. tarp down. Uh, and then also, I'll, I'll do the ground pod. And I found a spot in my backyard. Uh, we have a storm grate uh, just because of the amount of moisture we get. Um, so I'll put my camera in the storm grate so it's that much lower. Uh, it gets an even more low perspective uh, on the birds. It's actually right in front of the feeder. Uh, so that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it's cool they you have that to your advantage. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And you, just, track you never think, you know, I've been, been at that house for almost 10 years now. Never thought anything of it until I started photography. So, Yeah, it's like, what's the point of it besides being a storm drain? But like, here you are using it in this kind of like yeah. cool and creative way to get these better shots from it too. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. What about like bird seed and all that kind of stuff or even bird feeders? Like how much do you get involved with like researching and purchasing those kind of things? So that's, that's kind of all my mom. Um, so she has an ornithology background. Um, I kind of surpassed her in kind of interest in that. Uh, but she still handles all the bird seed stuff. She, she likes doing that. She likes backyard watching. Um, so I really don't know anything about it, quite honestly. So what about you? Um, well, I don't have a degree like your mom does, but um, it's cool, though, that she has that. Um, yeah, she's, just had... a, she's a minor in that. But uh, Oh, but still. Yeah, or, still, I mean, yeah. Apart ornithology is great so, she's yeah, traveled that, that, to galapagos and all kinds of places so she huh, that's yeah. awesome though yeah that's admirable um it's kind of like the flip for my mom because like i've had the teacher things and she'll be like she'll text me at random going like what's that one like she actually did this the other day because it's um it's the end of february as we're recording this and the the red-winged blackbirds are coming back through this area and she's like what's that one bird that goes con gongari <laughs> it's like i had to explain to her i'm like mom you know this one it's a red winged blackbird it you know it makes that metallic squawk sound conquer -y. yeah but anyways um, oh it's funny uh real quick on the red winged blackbird the same day yeah. you posted um that the red winged blackbirds were back on your story i heard one too in louisville it's crazy for the first oh, really? time yeah it's awesome yeah they're suddenly back in like full force i'm hearing all i'm seeing all these ebird reports um i start hearing them like in my neighborhood because they're so loud and vocal and now i'm starting to see them at my bird feeders um because they really take a liking to my platform one in oh, particular cool. and they'll just sit on it wow. yeah it's a weird it's a weird bird because because i i commonly associate with like the marshes and wetlands but like here it is in like once again suburban ohio neighborhood and like there's like two or three of them I'll sometimes see at once just hanging out and feeding. It's, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's not a bird I really expect, but like it comes back year after year. Yeah. Um, which is neat. Wow. Uh, anyways. Sorry, continue. I <laughs> yeah. just had to get that thought out. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a worthwhile tangent. Um, so yeah, I, I could be, I could get all nerdy and talk about bird seed and like what I think works and what doesn't and all that stuff, but I'll, I'll keep it a little short and brief here. Um, I would recommend, uh, avoiding anything with millet in it just because millet is basically like junk food for birds um that and what i mean by that is like most birds i think the only bird that really common passerine that likes it is like morning doves um for some reason they like millet because they'll, they'll eat just about any bird seed because they rely on that food source um specifically like i don't think they really eat too many of other like they don't eat berries or anything really else so that's why you see so many morning doves but um yeah i would i would avoid millet pretty much at all costs uh any i would avoid like seed mixes that have that um mm -hmm. and honestly i would recommend um you can kind of divide bird seed when you're purchasing into like two categories of like mixes and straights and straights is honestly just like 
any just like one ingredient or maybe two at most. It's a very basic bare bones kind of like seed mix. Mixes are like, they just throw all this crap in there. But like, once again, there's a lot of the millet and other kind of junk seeds that are just, they're not high nutritional value for birds. And honestly, they get kind of tossed aside because birds are kind of, they can be picky about what they eat. So like, they'll just toss and flake it on the ground and it just gets, you know, it's just useless basically. Um, so I would avoid like most mixes unless it was just like a good high quality one from like a good brand or something. Um, and I would just get stuff that's just plain, like almost all my bird seed is always black oil sunflower because it's like a, it's an all around favorite. Pretty much all birds like it. Sometimes I'll throw in like some woodpecker mixes that have like hard shell peanuts or whatever, like just in some, maybe some like berries and other kind of like hardier nuts, um, that woodpeckers love and maybe some like blue jays, but like, I would recommend something like that. Um, but like, if you're just now getting into like backyard birds, I would just say get black oil sunflower seeds. Those are just an all around universal favorite and you will attract the wide variety with just that alone. Um, but work up from that and just try a different variety of stuff. But once again, just experiment, just trial and error and see what happens. Um, try some suet and especially in the winter, not so much the summer because it melts and gets rancid, but try it during like the colder times of year and see if you can attract woodpeckers or nut hatches or anything like that. So lots there, but like you can, I can talk endlessly about it, but like that's yeah, kind of like the basics. We could do a whole bird seed episode. <laughs> I mean, I could probably, yeah, I could probably talk at length a while about it. Um, I don't know why, because it's not like really a, a focus of mine, but like, I just feel like it's good stuff to know, I guess, <laughs> to attract birds. But yeah. Whew. Anyways. Uh, this has been a great episode though I think oh, yeah, it's been sure. very informative and um, I hope everyone enjoyed it and it inspires them to go out and bird watch and photograph birds in the backyard of course mm -hmm. too yeah and if you guys take any cool backyard pictures just tag us we'll we'll share it on our story for sure uh huh. Uh, we'd, yeah we'd love to see some of that so yeah and leave us a review and tell us what you thought of the episode or the show overall and you know tell us what you like yeah. or want to see more of and yeah, we'll go from there. We've got some great guests coming. Uh, we got street photographers, bird photographers. Um, you know, we had great guests last week. Our, uh, Hester Astagora, he was awesome. Great wildlife photographer. So it's a lot of great stuff coming, and uh, we've got a lot of great stuff released. So thank you guys for listening. Yep, thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching the Owl Outdoors Photography Podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the video version on YouTube as well. You can subscribe down below, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.